The Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. EliteForm.com and IgnitionAPG.com And now, the Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast. Welcome to Iron Game Chalk Talk with your host, Ron McKeefrey. Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! Everything you got! On this podcast, hear Coach McKeefrey's straight talk about training, featuring the top strength and conditioning professionals from around the world. And now, here's your host, Ron McKeefrey. Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Ron McKeefrey, and this is episode number 52. Our Game Chalk Talk is a weekly podcast where I bring you experts in the field of strength and conditioning to talk shop each week. If you haven't already done so, make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes or YouTube or join my mailing list at ronmckeefrey.com to make sure that you get updates each week on the latest episodes. On the website is also the show notes for this episode and all the others to make sure that you have all the resources that we mentioned. This week, very excited to have Dan John with us. Dan John is a strength and conditioning coach based out in Utah, but he's you know has written several books, Intervention, um, Never Let Go, and uh, he lectures and puts on workshops uh, around the world. One of the one of the greats in our profession does a fantastic job. And I know you're going to get a, a ton out of this. We sit down, and we talk a little bit about his journey, um, his six fundamental movements. Uh, that he puts in his programming, talks a little bit about the assessment uh, procedure that he uses to evaluate not just um, his elite athletes, but also um, the average Joe that uses his facility, and, and, a, lot, and a lot more. You know, and, and he's he's a he's a wealth of information, and he shares it freely in this episode. Before we get started, I want to make sure we recognize our sponsors: EliteForm.com and IgnitionAPG.com for allowing us to bring this show to you for free each and every week. Make sure you reach out to them and say thank you when you get the opportunity. Elite Form is a sports science company out in Nebraska. And, uh, you know, recently just got a chance to go out to the CSCCA and uh, catch up with Skip and Avery and just sit there and talk shop and learn about all the neat things that they got coming down the pipe. What's great about Elite Form is they're, they're constantly getting feedback back from us and tweaking the programs that they have and the products that they have to uh, to make it better for us, you know. And, and uh, I really think that they're on the cutting edge, and more and more com- uh, programs are are putting elite form into uh, their facilities. I think New Mexico just went through a big in- uh, renovation, and, and they're putting it in there as well. But they have you know the strength tracker, their paperless system, um, and the, the strength planner light. So. If you, if you haven't checked out the Strength Planner, uh, go and, e- and send an email to igct at eliteform.com, igct at eliteform.com for a free 30-day trial. And I'm telling you, it's it's a not only is it a time saver, but the ability to push workouts to your athletes that may not be here during this time of year uh, is, is a phenomenal resource. So make sure you check out eliteform.com. Lastly, if you enjoy... Iron Game Chalk Talk, you'll definitely enjoy strength-ondemand.com. Strength On Demand is an online archive of strength and conditioning presentations that Rob Taylor and I and myself put together, really just to house all the presentations that we've that we've put on and the clinics that we've put on. And, and we've been very fortunate to get other people to contribute to this uh, as well. And so it's constantly growing and... Uh, uh, you, you know, we're, we're all looking for opportunities to continually learn, and this makes it so that you can do it from anywhere on your time, which is uh, the most precious thing that we have. So enough about that. I want to get going with Dan John. Sit back and enjoy this episode. I know that you'll get a ton out of it, and uh, make sure to take notes. We'll see you on the other side. Okay, guys, got one of the all-time greats, Dan John, with us. Coach, truly appreciate you coming on the show with us today. Well, thanks so much. It's uh, it's my pleasure. It's been a fun day. We had a great morning workout, and now we're I'm just kind of I'm doing a few house chores. So the time is perfect. <laughs> those honeydews. I, I've been doing those all day. Yeah, uh, yeah. You just got to keep up. You know how that goes. Yeah, yeah. Well, Coach and I finally we finally met um, at the Michigan 
uh, strength and conditioning clinic just recently, but I've been following them for a long time. And Chip Morton and Jeff Friday with the Bengals, uh, when I worked with them, you know, really, you know, put me on you hardcore. And so in that in that period of time, I really pretty much read everything that you had put out. And uh, really, you know, for everybody that hasn't had a chance to to come across you yet, maybe uh, briefly, because I know you you get to a hundred of these things. Tell tell us your story, how you got into the field, and kind of what you're doing now. Well, well, my aunt died, and my brothers bought a Sears Ted Williams uh, barbell set, and <laughs> so I started lifting weights in that in 1965, and then uh, I pretty much started. Mm, Pretty progressive, solid lifting. I was seventh and eighth grade when I went to junior high. We had a real good program there uh, in uh, at Southwood, and I still use a lot of the things I learned there. Um, and then I always kind of helped other people. One of my neighbors called me the Pied Piper. Uh, I have this. I, I I like groups. I like being around people. And then uh, when I went off to college, I started working. Even though I was a discus thrower. I helped a lot of the football players with uh, weightlifting because their coaches were making them do uh, novice machines, uh, one set to failure. And these guys knew that if they want to make it in the NFL or Canadian football, um, they needed a bigger system. And so I would, they would sneak up to the, where we trained the track athletes, we trained the hyper, and I would show them how to clean. And you know, and so I started coaching right out of college in '79, and. Mostly was just I just coached the Olympic lifts at first. I mean, the answer to all my questions, all questions was snatch and clean and jerk. And you know, <laughs> it's, you know, it's it, you know, it's you always do that. You know, Pavel always says if you all you have is a hammer, the whole world's a nail. And so my my hammer was the old lifts, and I quickly picked up. And I'd like to say the process of thirty five years is that I was right. I mean, one of the great answers is the Olympic lifts, but. You know, you have to also take people where they are, Absolutely. and it might be planks, not not snatches. It might be maybe push a car versus you know front squats. You know, wherever you can, wherever you can get them, that's the key, I think. Mm-hmm. So, nutshell, there's the history. Yeah, and you have a, you have a, a facility out there in Utah, and you, and you have kind of an open lift. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I call it an intentional community. Every day at nine thirty. Whoever wants to show up shows up. Uh, today, I think we had 11 people. And uh, Josh Hillis, who's the pretty noted uh, uh, female fat loss expert, was had spent the night, but he had to leave to take off to Denver. So we would have had 12. Um, but doors open, and uh, you come and train if you want to do the – we have like a little pattern workout we do. Uh, Monday is focused on the hinge and squat. Tuesdays is pull focused. Thursdays press focused. And – Fridays carries with Wednesdays being more like groundwork. Uh, but every day, no matter what, we do all the human movements, no matter what, we do them all. So even though it's a pull day, you're still doing some presses. Even though it's a carries day, you're still doing all the other things. And the nice thing is, is if you just show up for one day, I think you'll get a real sense of how we work in community. But you'll see people coaching me. I mean, I'll be bouncing. I, I'm on a I'm on a new program. I have a little goal I want to do. And so, you know, Mike and Mark stayed there until 1230 because it took me a long time to get my presses in today. I had an interview with uh, the University of Leeds in England, and <laughs> just, it was, which was great, but that was right in the middle. So, you know, we stick around. We, we talk. Sometimes we go to lunch. Sometimes we people just have to leave for their jobs and other commitments. And it's open uh, – it's real open. Today we had an Olympic lifter uh, from another team come and train with us because he wanted to learn because, you know, he heard about swings and stuff. And so here you got an old lifter doing kettlebells and sometimes you have a kettlebeller doing the Olympic lifts. And I guess that gets back to the original thing about, I mean, I want a big toolkit as a coach. And right. the way I, the only way I can increase my toolkit is, ex, you know, getting exposed to, to criticism, getting exposed to insights, you know, and trying to, and trying to work with that, yeah. Well, what you said was really, you know, really in, impactful when, you, when we were talked was that you know you had anywhere from the major league baseball all star training next to the, you know, the sixty year old woman, you know, in, in, in that session. Right, and they might be doing the exact same thing. You know, they they, they might be 
doing gobble squats and hip flexor stretches right next to each other. And the funny thing is the load isn't that always that big a deal because, you know, mastery of movement would have to come first. So, yeah, I, I, I'm getting a lot of traction in the professional sports. Right. Uh, people like – because – you know, I'm not a big believer that any single workout is going to be that. And this is a hard thing if you, for the guys listening to Coach High School. They know. High school kids always think it's a one, one and done. They're convinced that they'll come in the off season and get that workout and get sore and never come back. You've got to keep coming back to improve. And that's true about everything, I think, you know. Well, you get you kind of how good of a coach you are too. I mean, the, the the major league baseball player all star. That's an easy guy to go coach. You know the the you know the you know the sixty year old with goals. I mean, sometimes that's a little bit more difficult to you know to really get across coaching cues and things along those lines. And so I, I know you had made that point. You know, I, in your books and and you know hearing you speak a couple times, you know you 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 talk about if it's important, you do it every day. And you and you right. you alluded to that earlier. With you know, even though um, you know it might be a push emphasis, you're still doing all the fun, you know, the fun foundational movements. You have five plus one foundational movements. What what are those? Push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry, and then sixth everything else. The sixth movements, everything else. But mostly we have to emphasize groundwork. So most of the time it's working on the ground. You know that would be where. Most people, in fact, that's the biggest gap most programs have. They never go on the ground. And even if you do something as simple as push-ups and get back up, I mean, you're, you're, you're already ahead. Of course, I teach tumbling and I teach, uh, of course, we use ab wheels, Turkish get-ups, tumbling. We're, we're, we try to really emphasize that. That's a big deal in our school. You know, to really try to emphasize getting on the ground and getting back up a lot. Yeah. Yeah. We talked at the at the clinic a lot about that, about the you know the the lack of physical education anymore, and and how tumbling and gymnastics and things were were, you know, were stuff that were commonplace even you know when I was in elementary school. You know now anymore you're lucky if they have a, a physical education class. Period. What are some of your observations that you've seen with working with a wide range of athletes in terms of their overall athleticism? Well, I mean, uh, certainly p people today are bigger than they've ever been, but what we're, especially in a sport like track and field, we're not seeing it. We're not really seeing truly considered the numbers. I mean, you know, people are like in the throws, you could argue, well, we have, you know, the national record so much farther, but, you know, those are kind of outliers, you know. But what we're seeing is we're getting kids who weigh 230 throwing the discus 130, mm -hmm. where when I was in high school, it wasn't uncommon to throw your body weight in the discus, for example. That wasn't uncommon. And uh, nowadays, that's just, I mean, that's almost unheard of. I mean, but I think that's a great goal for high school boys. So it's, the kids are coming in with big engines, um, but they don't, <laughs> maybe they need better wheels and suspension. So, you know, to keep that, beat the heck out of that analogy. But w they're coming in with big engines now. They've got the big power lifts. Uh, very often, you know, they, they know they know the name of every muscle, you know, they know, uh, they know stuff, but they don't really apply it. And that's why I think the need for the groundwork and the loaded carries to transform them from, you know, standing on a platform to movement. Right. And I think that's where, I think that's the big gap. Uh, I still think that's the big gap. Um, people were trying to do it for, it's funny cause I agree a hundred percent. I tend to focus as a coach on what air force is doing and what wake forest is doing because the school's. I've coached that usually were more more academic. Uh, the kids didn't have a lot of time, mm -hmm. but you know, you'll remember when uh, odd objects was the rage about maybe oh, is it fifteen years ago now? Ten years ago? Well, Al Hedrick out there at Air Force did it quite a bit, absolutely. Yeah, do you remember that where everything was moving and sandbag and sandbags are still around? Of course, it's all still around. But my my thought even at the time was. Instead of doing odd object lifting, we're back on the platform. The kid's still in, Olymp in, in lifting shoes. Is take that odd object and take it outside and walk around or play catch with it or you know pick it up and put it down. Right. Which I still think is, is so. I still think those are the two big gaps: groundwork and any kind of movement carries. You know, loaded carry in our system. No, that's great. You know, now you know 
when you say you, you put everything in the workout and, you, and you're putting tumbling in the workout and, and, and things on those kind, how does that flow? You know, when they when they walk into the gym, is it they're doing their they're tumbling first as a part of the warm up? You need uh, for like if I have a kid for four. It's funny, Mike Brown made this point yesterday. Is I always see kids. My thought is three or four years. You know, it's always going to be that way. So I think that if you have a system that supports this idea, that I would say in the academic year, okay, let's just use the school because it's the easiest way of teaching, is that like two Wednesdays a month or two sessions a month, you should do a general warm-up and then get yourself into the wrestling room or wherever you got the mats. Uh, I start off I start off every year with the basic somersault, the shoulder rolls, uh, the combination shoulder rolls, uh, backward rolls were never that good. We never got very good at them. Uh, cartwheels, both directions. And then we build up to it and build up and build up at it. Handstands, things like that. Some of the kids can come in on the first day and walk on their hands. And some of the kids might never even do a handstand. But the nice thing about tumbling is that you're teaching them, you know, uh, to break fall, to not hurt themselves on the fall. Yeah. And so that's the, that's the best lesson. Uh, I do think it's actually probably the best injury prevention I know. Instead of taping everybody up, teach them how to fall in a number of different ways safely. Agreed. Um, so now, after a couple weeks every year, I would start. Uh, I had a tumbling mat down the middle of my weight room, and uh, and on some of our uh, circuit training things, we call them drum lines because of that movie came out at the time, but. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we would add like somersaults into uh, a circuit. Like you would do well, a classic one for us would be like front squat, bench press, a rolling circuit, walking over hurdles, uh, power clean, say, and then repeat on that. Okay, mm -hmm. that would be pretty. That would not be unusual to see that. And so you you see tumbling comes in two ways. One, uh, pure practice, and in the other way, part of the training system. Uh, what's good about this particular thing is that there is a lot of things you pick up from tumbling. There is a kind of conditioning hit that really, I mean, I would also put pure wrestling in there with this, but that weird out of breath, your head spins around kind of conditioning hit that is hard to kind of explain. Uh, you have to kind of feel it to understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but when you play football, for example, or rugby, even wrestling, you know, People, you get knocked down. In fact, sometimes I think it's an advantage to get knocked down because you pop back up. And the play, very few offensive plays <laughs> involve you being blocked twice. Mm -hmm. You know, So get, get yourself on the ground, roll, and pop right back up. You're still in the play. Right. This guy made a million-dollar block on you. You rolled, and now you make the tackle for a loss. Now, he gets graded out as a perfect block, but mm -hmm. he still play lost. You know, so now what do you, you know, so there's some real on field advantage. And of course, you know, running backs tend to hurt their shoulders because they try to reach for the ground instead of just rolling on tackle. Sure. And you're not going to stop, you know, my, my hand is not going to stop the two of us falling to the ground. Yeah. And kids think all the time. So. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that, that's the, remember anything I'm saying, there's always those extra bonuses um, from having this kind of movement based vision, you know, everybody on team bench in 300 in high school is, is, it's fine. But my team that's doing, uh, hurdle walkovers and loaded hurdle walkovers and tumbling is to be more game ready. Right. Now, you just might out physical us, but I like our chances still. Sure. You know, we talked at, at the conference about your assessment. Uh, procedure, you know, when somebody walks into the into the weight room for the first time, you kind of put them into three plates or three areas. You know, you kind of assess them by body composition, and mobility, and and strength. You know, can you talk a little bit about that process? Well, you have to be careful here because you now with that particular assessment, that would be some that would be a typical adult. Okay, so that would be someone over twenty twenty five. That would be somebody who isn't. If they say they want to throw Masters track and field or run a triathlon, basically it's just to me it's just shake and bake. I mean, I'm just going to follow the recipe. And we're going to push, pull, hinge, squat, load, and carry, and do some groundwork with them, and then get them out to the field to play. Mm -hmm. but 
for everybody else who's over 25, not in a sport. Um, you know, I have some things I do with them. There's some questions I, I ask. Um, there's a, a, a very, here's a very simple one, and I think this is to help anyone listen. If the person is over 300 pounds, uh, that is an, um, before I work with them, uh, I would I want them to go to a dentist, see an eye doctor, and see a medical doctor. And then when I do train them, I want to keep a heart rate monitor on them because uh, my doctor, Dr. Brunetti, has told me that over 300 pounds, it's funny because people raise their hands and say, what if they're 299? It's like, <laughs> that's not 300, is it? That's not 300. But right. over 300, the statistics on all the stuff that we do changes radically. Uh, including uh, longe- life, you know, longevity, the amount of years in your life, uh, their adaption to everything. And the reason I keep heart rate monitors on them isn't so much for me, is that so my young interns and assistants can see the 300-pound person doing three presses might now have their heart rate at 174. Mm-hmm. Three presses, one, two, three, heart rate 174. Wow. So they, I mean, to me... I use Maffy Tone's number in the weight room, 180 minus your age. Yep. So, you know, so for me, that's 124. I mean, that's right. not very high, I think. 180 minus 56, I'm hoping I'm right. <laughs> My mask is notoriously awful. But um, so for me, you know, if you're training me and you, you see my heart rate at 140, uh, I'm 56. I'm arguing with you later on that you might have pushed me a little bit too deep. Gotcha. So... But here's a simple assessment. Now, the other reason I have you see a dentist is we've, this is a lot of my experience, but there is some fact behind it. <clears throat> People who are struggling with obesity tend to have uh, teeth issues. Uh, in fact, to the point that it might actually make them want more mushy food. Uh, the second with the eye doctor is the eye doctor can see diabetes and that the eye doctor can see uh, high blood pressure. Uh, which is amazing. They can see they can see what's going on there. So, and of course, your medical doctor is going to do a blood test and a, and a blood pressure test and say, "Hey." <laughs> so, by the time they come back from those three visits, they'll listen to me about one eighty minus age. Right. When the, what they want to, me to do on the first day is, you know, it took them thirty years to get up to three hundred pounds. They want me to do that in thirty minutes yeah, to right. get it. All- and what I want them to hear is that we're, we're looking at a process here. Uh, another simple one that I use is that this is the one I, I for challenge for strength. It's not a popular test. I got it from Stu McGill, holding a two-minute plank. If you fail a two-minute plank, I don't care how you plank it, by the way. Don't, don't worry. Any plank is fine. Um, you, you're not strong enough. Mm-hmm. So getting you stronger is going to help your body composition. In fact, getting you stronger might even help your, uh, your mobility. Okay, so there's a you know it's a one it's called the one two three four uh, system, uh, one quick test, two quick measurements, three questions, and the plank uh, and the uh, plank test, and sometimes we add a few other things, but those at least that's how I assess. And what's interesting about this assessment is that uh, most of the people, most of my guys who are using it, have discovered that most of their clients are sevens, which means they have body comp, mobility, and strength issues. Mm-hmm. And the funny thing is, when you realize that, just reach for the low-hanging fruit, you know. Uh, don't tell them to go on the most scientific diet the world's ever seen. Don't don't seek perfection. You know, stretch them out, get them a little stronger, and ask them to drink water. Right. By two weeks, that might be, you know, in, in six workouts in two weeks, all, I would say, easy to low-moderate and drinking more water. This person hops on the scale, they could be. It could be 14 pounds lighter and you're a miracle worker, <laughs> you know, uh, which is not, you know, when you get a guy like Josh Hillis and that's the kind of numbers you hear, you know, it's, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, when I work with uh, a professional athletes, they tend to be what we call six and they need mobility and strength issues. And so what I'm looking now, okay, so we just, we just slid now. Mm-hmm. We just slid at how the two things, how an older athlete uh, how I'm using that assessment to help an older athlete stay around a couple more years. Most of them tend to, tend to really have gaps in their training first. That's the most common. Right. Uh, they no loaded carries, but now it's more common now. So it's not not like it was say 15 years ago when no one no one even heard of <laughs> never even heard of farmer carries or pushing cars. It's funny because 
all those old guys know pushing cars because you know I still or even sleds pushing football sleds. Yeah, um, I know it has no carryover to the game of football. I know that, but it's a great conditioner. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Um, so with these guys, I tend to focus on mobility and strength, and I don't worry about their body comp. We'll worry about their body comp when they retire. You know. Sure. For most of them, so really, it's funny when you see uh, us train a, a professional athlete. Almost always, it's strength, move, mobility, move, strength, move, mobility, move. Just back to back to back to back to back the whole time. Uh, so their rest period is always a mobility movement. Right. Always. Yeah. Well, Coach, you've been in this this field for for a couple of years now, right? You know what what are some positive things that you've seen out of it, and what are some things that still need to improve? Well, the, the biggest problem has always been is that uh, it's six weeks and 90 days. It's, those are the two numbers that come out usually. You, I mean, I'm telling you from the heart, if you only have six weeks to get somebody in shape, get them on Nautilus. Nautilus is perfect for six weeks. Yeah. Six weeks and one day, it's worthless. I mean, it's just you're done. You, um, you always hear in 90 days. Of course, 90 days is what's so popular on those DVDs on TV now. But – in the field, we always have to think of four years, eight years. You know, my, my coach, the, the late, great uh, Ralph Mon, you know, little and often over the long haul. But we're still in this mindset of, uh, you know, you know, just 30, you know, in six weeks. And, and I think, like, for example, if you want to be successful, I mean, this, I'm throwing my two cents in there, but yeah. uh, there's, a, there's a football coach who's famous for turning things around in two years. And then he sets up a culture he can't survive the third year. Well, what happens is, you know, you get the strength coach to go in and make everybody puke and you clo- lock the doors and you know, make everybody puke. Your athletes will do that the first year. And the, you'll get the second year out of them. You're not going to get a third year out of them. Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to start getting, you know, coach, my, my hamstrings pulled. You know, you know. Um, so at a program like that, I look at it and I uh, – I was with the, the Division One coach who's a good friend of mine, and uh, I, I just said something off the cuff, and he said, my God, I've never thought of it. He's, uh, he works with football and at a very, very big kid school, and uh, I asked him, what did, you know, how, do you detra- how do you deload your senior football players? You know, how do you transition those guys who are not going to go to the NFL? Right. And he goes, we don't do anything. And I'm like, well, okay, okay. You, need to put that in, you need to put that into your program. Right. So, so what you want is you want your freshman kid to see that five-year redshirt guy still part of the program, still passing on gems, being around. Yeah, maybe he's maybe he's not snatching and cleaning and jerking, but he's still he's in the weight room and and, and you know un, you know dealing with the injuries he's picked up over five years. So you've got a healthy human being. <laughs> he's twenty-three years old. Right. He's old. It's old. He's got a long, long road ahead of him. You can't weigh 320 the rest of your life and be happy. So uh, that would be the biggest thing for me still is this idea. The, the, the second thing is this idea that, you know, if you're not vomiting, you're not training hard. Uh, these people that use some uh, mythical, uh, they just, you know, this, this, you know, they use all kinds of female body parts analogies if you don't. Mm. Um I'm really bothered by it. Uh, the injury rates on these programs are through the roof, and again, we're not dealing long term with with the athlete. I mean, I mean, I don't know, but if a university, again, maybe speaking out of school here, but you know, if a university had thirty seniors in their program who'd been around four or five years training intelligently, uh, running the exact basic system for four years, five years, they'd be pretty good. I mean, right. I'm reminded. West Virginia team back in the 80s who made it all the way. I think they lost to Notre Dame in the big the, the showdown game, the bowl game. But they had five starting offensive linemen who had been together, I think, three years. Mm. Well, they weren't that good of a team on paper, but when you add up what they had, they are pretty good. Right. So, you know, that's why I think, that's why, again, why I look at the Wake Forests and the, the Air Forces, and, and there's others. I'm just, those are just two examples came that there's many others who really see a commitment to a long-term commitment because they just don't have the resources not to, Sure. you know? Sure. So those would be, those would be the two, uh, this still, this, 
and, and it really, it's funny because really they swarm, swim around one idea of, you know, this overnight success thing, this overnight change. And that just doesn't work in any aspect of life, not a single aspect of life. Absolutely. Well, it's the microwave tech, uh, society, right? They want it instant. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, you know, coach, I know you're, you're real busy. We w- want to get you going, but, you know, before you do, we, we always end these shows with some resources. So give us a motivational quote that you guys either have plastered in your weight room or one that you live by. Well, our family has one that I think is really important uh, for every aspect of life, was well, too, but I'll give you uh, It's not where you start, it's where you finish. And I, the biggest mistake I think most of your high school coaches listening is they fall in love with the kid who looks like Tarzan in seventh grade. Right. You know, if you're from the Mediterranean Rim and you hit puberty in the seventh grade, you're going to be the best baseball player on the team. Now, the downside is that might be all you ever get out of that kid. Mm-hmm. That 71 mile an hour fastball that's so great in the sixth grade uh, is target practice when he's a senior, right. you know, five, six years later. And so, I mean, really, there's, uh, every, every coach who's coached high school uh, will have a story about the 118 pound kid that. Who talks like this? And who becomes just a you know, you know, all state, all world phenomenon for right. five years? And I think, you know, when people tell me about their strength programs, um, my thing always is, you know, well, we, we don't have all that stuff. Okay, fine, do what we did. I mean, I we had to we use PVC pipes to make slosh pipes. Mm-hmm. You know, we steel plates. I mean. <laughs> My old weight room had plates from literally all over the world. You know, people would, people would be on a trip and drop weights, bikes, and we had, I don't think we ever had a dumbbell that matched, ever. Uh, so it's not where you start, it's where you finish. And it's funny because people actually think after a while that you're doing this for a reason. Oh, so unilateral dumbbell presses, yeah, the different weights. And you look at it and go, well, that's because we don't have any dumbbells to match. That's a, but they thought it was some insightful training program, you know. <laughs> so it's not when you start to finish, and that's true about your facility. That's true about your personnel. You know, when I – sorry, that's my wife's phone. Oh. Sorry, when, uh, when, you know, you hire an assistant, you know, you know – the, you know, the principal will always sit you down, you know, you got the Nobel Peace Prize, you've got, you know, you speak 72 languages, and then they'll say, uh, can you coach football? Well, uh, you know, it's always, it's always, and then the football coaches will be like, oh, we run the, you know, whatever. <laughs> and you, know, you really got to, you know, you really got to practice, um, I'm very good with this with my interns, you know, but, okay, so you, you know this from the college, that's great. So now I want you to learn the kettlebells. And now I want you to learn the TRX. And now I want you to learn uh, the powerless. Um, Dan, you're going to Olympic with me. When, when do I learn those? Well, when you well, okay, let's. This is how you do them. But see how they all knit together. But the problem I think happens sometimes is these poor young guys think they need to, you know, have a PhD in the Olympic lifts, PhD in the powerless, and you know, you just it's not where you start, it's where you finish. Just keep building that up. Learn a little bit every year. And the other thing that would tie right into that, of course, is always realize you're going to keep throughout the next five decades about 80% of what you're doing now. The problem is, and I always joke, is we just don't know what that 80% is. You know? <laughs> That's true. Uh, and if you had told me years ago, I have discus throwers now. I don't, don't do the Olympic lifts because their age or their injuries, we've found other tools. Right. So in a sense, it's even funny, even with throwers, I've thrown out some really important things and no, that's great. Well, coach, I know you do a, a lot of traveling, and I know your you know your your um, continuing education is very important to you. What what are some resources, a, a website, maybe an app that you use, um, and then a book recommendation? Well, yeah, the problem with websites is they, uh, you know, it's funny. I, I like websites that have mellowed a bit with time. You know. When everyone stops, you know, trying to be so, you know, I'm going to smash my face against the wall five more times than you. <laughs> but there's there's a bunch, you know. Uh, I have this little thing on my Kindle called Feely or something like that. And so I read Brett Contreras' blog, uh, Tony, I want to say Gallencore, his blog. Yeah. I, I, I do those because, you know, they're – they're more in the bit. They're out there researching. I read Cressy. I read T Nation. 
there's some other ones I read. Um, it's funny, some of the most obnoxious places on the web really have great information. Um, I try to stay away from um, sites that are that are kind of run with one. I mean, these are the four lifts. If you don't, if you do any more, you're stupid. I stay away from those. Those yeah. kind of, uh, and I like to really expand myself sometimes. Not, I mean, I, I don't want. I don't want to skip anybody. No, you're fine. Uh, yeah, that's good. That's good. What about a book? What's the latest book that you've read, or one that I, you know that you recommend? <laughs> latest book I've read. Uh, I just I'll tell you, it's funny. Um, it actually is this. Everything I'm about to say is true. I, my wife, when we were in uh, uh, England, there was this bin that were there three books for nine ninety nine euro, and one of the best books I ever read in my life was called Skippy Dies. And she bought it there. Another book called Weird Sister. She bought it there. So I read those two. Fantastic books. Third one was Moneyball. Really? And I'm telling you, Moneyball might be one of the best coaching books I've ever read in my life. Um, it's kind of like reading uh, Gladwell's books, you know, Outliers. Uh, yep. It's kind of like reading uh, Free Economics in some ways. But what I liked about it, and I'm a big fan, uh, David Emery, the, the uh, 68 Olympic hurdle champion, uh, put pen to paper and figured out how to win with his skills, how he could win the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Edward Moses did the same thing at, uh, eight years later to win the Olympics. Roger Bannister famously put pen to paper. And I think, uh, I think Moneyball reminds us how important it is to put pen to paper before you do anything. That's great. You know, there's always a smarter, better way to do it. And I think Moneyball is a fun book, um, that shows you, this how we uh, act we overprice people you know we over i know we all do as football coaches we always think oh there's no way we could have won any games without little billy and then billy blows his knee out and all of a sudden we're a better football team you know how'd that happen sure well no i know what's called football there's there tends <laughs> little billy we forget that little billy had 10 other people doing a lot of work right. to make little billy look good you know um so that that would be my it's kind of funny to say that because it's actually the last book i've done I finished it Monday. So. Oh, it's fantastic. Well, yeah. Coach, well, you, you know, you've got a, a handful of books as well. We're going to make sure we link all those up in your website. And, and what, what else do you got going on? You got anything down the pipe here that we should be looking for? Well, in fact, uh, Josh Hill has spent the night here last night. We had a we have a book coming out. It's called It Starts on Mon Fat Loss Starts on Monday, and it's 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 focused for the female because he's so good at it and just so my. <laughs> My, my doodlings, uh, but it's his basically his book, and I think that's going to be a real solid book. If I was a strength coach, um, I would look at it because he believes you do four basic movements. Okay, four ba he, master these four things, you know, and then get really good at these parts. You know, he, he believes a one perfect meal a week. So you, at first, you're just going to have a perfect meal. Tuesday's breakfast is be the best breakfast I've ever made in my life. And then what you try to do over time is perfect two meals a week and then maybe one, you know. And he just, it's the whole emotional and mental side of fat loss. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I like that is because uh, if you understand the, mo uh, the emotional mental side of fat loss, it might give us, it gives us insights into how to coach the athlete. Um, the, the better I got with, I used to do this drill as a throw, throws coach called the, the one throw contest. Where I try to get my athletes to think that, you know, you're, you're, you get one throw, and I would stop them in the middle of their throw and mess with their heads. Um, we had a lot of state champions who later told me that was that was it, because they practiced this terrible burden of only having one throw. I mean, if you got two fouls in your pocket at the state meet, you got it's a one throw contest. That's it. If you're behind by two feet on your last throw as a senior, it's not a one throw career. That's it. So, uh, so I like to, I, I, I always like to think about the emotional, mental side of things. No, it's fantastic. Well, coach, well, somebody that's that's benefited from your teachings, I truly appreciate what you know, all the work that you do, and and, and your willingness to share your information with everybody. And uh, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show, man. It's pretty easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. You bet. We'll that's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. 
Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors, EliteForm.com and IgnitionAPG.com for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out RonMcKeefree.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefree's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefree in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefrey can be found on Twitter at rmckeefrey, on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash ron.mckeefrey. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk.